You obviously know that Korra uses a shortened intro after episode one, but did you ever notice that all the bending showcase moves also get shortened? Earth. Fire. You think that they just went and pulled these off the restaurant wall? Or is there just a place where you can buy these weird photos of Tano? I guess he is a pro athlete. Maybe there would be like a stand somewhere selling Tano merch? The Music yes. Hour! Brought to you by Cabbage Corp. Republic City's trusted name in technology for over 50 years. Cabbage Corp? What a weird name for a tech company. Mako, don't throw fire kicks at the earth bending net. You're gonna burn it down. You should know better than that. You're a pro. You can see some sweat go flying as Mako takes his helmet off here. Good morning, citizens of Republic City. This is Amon. I hope you all enjoyed last- Pabu either understands that this is Amon and is freaked out by it, was frightened by the sinister background music, or Amon's voice has some strange anti-ferret properties. Which kind of sounds like one of my patron shoutouts. How does Amon keep taking over the air anyway? I know it's shown later that he's funded by Asami's dad, but does that help in hijacking radio broadcasts? As the Avatar and a pro-bending player, I have a right to be heard. You can't cancel the finals. I know winning the championship means a lot to you, but as far as I'm concerned, we need to shut the arena down. Hmm, it's an interesting dilemma, actually, because for one, obviously, you want to keep people safe. That should be paramount. On the other hand, you can't really bow down to this vague threat from a guy that hasn't really done anything very aggressive at all yet, like on a grand scale. As leaders, you need to seem strong to the people, or you won't be their leaders for very long. But I do agree, probably shut that shit down. Tenzin being on the side of safety makes sense, knowing him. And I think Tarlock agreeing with him is once again supposed to play into the red herring that he's actually Amon. Korra and a company here seem very short-sighted and selfish. They don't care about anyone's safety, they just want to win the ship. They don't even have like a good argument, they're like stuttering and shit. Right now the arena is the one place where benders and non-benders gather together in, in peace to watch benders beat each other up. Like I get that they're competitive, but I feel like at least one of our heroes should be like, ah, maybe let's look out for the safety of the people of the city. I'm sorry, but our decision has been made. This meeting is adjourned. No ruling is official unless I hit this table with a hammer. Now that the hammer is broken, we have entered anarchy. It's time that the benders of this city displayed some strength and unity against these equalists. Lin's reasoning seems odd here. We're obviously on the side of the benders, the story is being told from their side, and there are heroes. But the thing is, our heroes are in the position of power here. Amon is supposed to be an upstart revolutionist, the head of a small but dangerous group. But the way Lin phrases this, it sounds like the non-benders have been running amok, chaos in the streets, but we haven't seen that. The the conflict between benders and non-benders hasn't been shown at all, like on a systemic or cultural level. We don't ever see benders actually intimidate or bring down non-benders or target them specifically. Amon's movement is based on this whole idea that non-benders are being treated like second-class citizens, but we haven't been shown that at all. Like sure, this guy yells about it, but have you ever heard of show don't tell? The only conflicts we've seen are when Bolin got kidnapped and Amon did his whole revelation thing, in which case the non-benders were the aggressors, and Tarlock's hit on the chi blocking training, which if you remove the Amon imagery on the walls and the weird face masks, which would just be him running in and ruining a karate class. We also see the triads intimidate that shop owner in the first episode, but that scene was more telling you that, ooh, there's crime in Republic City. It was never said that specifically this shopkeep was a non-bender and that's why he was being targeted. It would have helped a lot if they did say that actually. But this entire conflict, we haven't seen what it's about, what Amon is preaching about, or even that Amon is a big enough threat to actually make the demands he's making. We have entire episodes where he's not even mentioned. Lin saying that we have to stand up to the equalist sounds really hollow because I don't even know if this conflict even really is. I am changing. Changing my vote. Who else is with me? Why are there even other council members other than Tarlock and Tenzin? They literally just agree with the thing that's been said most recently. But they still get to sit there just like, hmm, yeah, it's quite right. Good luck in the finals. All right! Yeah! Thank you! And good luck to you. Chief Beifong. Man, they made this dude really fucking sinister in every single scene for almost no reason when you think about it when you know the whole story, right? Like, yeah, all of Tarlock's moves are to actually give him more power, obviously, but that's pretty much it. He doesn't have anything going on other than the very obvious and surface level motivation of I want more power. Nothing that warrants the show treating him like he's 100 snakes crammed into a human body that are all just waiting to lunge. My father and Lynn got along famously. I'm afraid her issues are with me. You and Beifong, Beifong and you, you two were a couple. What? How? Where'd you get that idea? I mean, even though the core is correct, it's still a pretty big leap. Tenzin never really gave her a hint that that was it at all. Korra only knows that Tenzin was with another woman before Pema. Korra has the same jumping to the right, completely out of nowhere conclusion skill as Sokka. Anyway, Pema didn't steal me. Lin and I had been growing apart for some time. We both had 
different goals in life. Why am I even telling you this? Right? Can we move on from this shit? I don't want to hear about an ancient love triangle. I'm sick of the one we've already got going. How is the security sweep going? Fine. They've checked underneath the stands? Yes. All right, the place isn't rigged already, and we've got hella police enforcement all around the arena. So as long as we have an effective security check for everyone that attends the game, we shouldn't have any issues, right? All right, Lynn, you're doing a great job. I'm glad you're on the case. Lynn, with so much on the line, it would be nice if we could help each other out. At least for one night. Like old times? Like old times. Okay, weird tangent here. At some point in his life, Tenzin must have come to grips with the intense responsibility of having to carry on the airbending line. Like, who's to say how many kids Katara and Aang would have had if they kept having kids that didn't turn out to be airbenders, right? Aang would have wanted to keep having kids until they had at least one. Luckily, their third, Tenzin, turned out to be one. But now Tenzin is saddled with that exact same responsibility. And I'm sure the notion that his sister Kaya is a waterbender crossed his mind. Since Aang and Katara were both different kinds of benders, the chances of having an airbending child was lesser. They could have had a waterbender an airbender or a non-bender. So if Tenzin were to settle down with Lin, his chances of carrying on the airbending line would also be lesser, since Lin is an earthbender, meaning that Pema, the non-bender, would be a much better match because it would be easier to have airbending kids. Now, I'm not saying that's the reason why Tenzin broke up with Lin for Pema, I'm just saying that's something he would have had to think about. Now I know there's a big crowd, but don't be nervous. You're gonna do great. I believe in you. Weirdly, this isn't the first time we see Pabu in uniform. We see him briefly in it last episode too, but I guess Bolin just wants to make a big deal out of it now. Kind of an obvious one, but these guys are only shown for a few split second shots. These fans are dressed up like our heroes. Introducing the challengers. Why do you need a piece of paper when you only have to introduce two teams? Fucking get over it already. Hey, seems like their starting position is shifting around. Korra is now taking the center position, and in a game that seemingly has so little strategy involved in it, a small change like that is probably a big deal. Mako is like one step away from the line here, but then he stumbles back at least two before getting pushed back more and more and then finally crossing the line. Charles, who gets fancy but Bolin ricochets at this off the ropes and says no, thank you sir! This is a weird one. Usually interrupted firebending kind of just fizzles. There's even that one time in the book one finale to Airbender where Zuko's fireball just loses all momentum too. But here the fire just ceases to exist in a single frame. Kano gets a little too worked up and unleashes a deluge on Bolin that will certainly elicit a foul. Or apparently not. What's the big idea, ref? That was a hosing foul. And the wolf bat. Ming trips up Paco with another dirty trick. Uh, oh, come on, refs. There was some funny business in that last play. I kind of really like the idea that Tenzin is a low-key big fan of the sport, but he's too proud to admit it to anyone. That's a funny thought. It's a knockout. That's bullshit, that bell went. You can't even blame the wolf bats for celebrating. You fight till the bell. This round should be over. That bell man should be fired. Wait, so they're treating that bell like it was the end of the round. So why wasn't Mako given a red fan for attacking after the bell then? Why are the game sounds still on? If the wolf bats are gonna fight dirty, then so should we. I don't know if I like that our protagonist is instantly like, let's cheat back. Like I get that you're gonna change from this mindset in the future, but can you be at least good enough that I can root for you? Round two. Whoa, this dude just teleported. Why isn't this guy the main character? He can fly and teleport? Round two will be decided with a tiebreaker. Okay, so we get an abridged round two where it ends up a tie. So we go to a 1v1 to break the tie. But it's not for the entire match like last game because it's only round two. But it should be for the entire match if the Wolf Bats win, right? Because if you win a tiebreaker for your second round win, you just win the whole thing, according to that last game, right? Tano seems to be weirdly level with his teammate here, despite being raised a good, like, five or six feet, probably. Now I know, because of people posting in my comments the actual rules of pro bending they read in a lore book, that the different mediums of bending have different rules. But the common viewer does not know this, so Korra winning with his headshot, celebrated in slow motion and everything, and having the crowd erupt into cheers, seems very odd after hearing the announcer say this not two minutes ago. Wow! Those look like illegal headshots to me! So, for the layman, allow me to ask, what are the rules? What are the rules? Korra seems very short in this shot, when she is definitely not. It's all down to this final round! What do you mean it's all down to this final round? We're only on round three. What are the rules? Well, you gotta go and find out the rules. Kano and Ming are up to more shenanigans. Uh, 
Oh, this has gone too far. Oh, come on. Those were illegal headshots. Open your eyes, ref. What do you mean those were illegal headshots? Why aren't you complaining about the rocks in the water? If Tencent didn't see the rocks in the water, then those headshots wouldn't have been illegal since the shot was thrown by a waterbender. If those shots were illegal, so was Korra's. What are the rules? How the hell you gonna find out the rules? Lynn, you're telling me your security detail wasn't running personal checks? These guys all snuck in here keeping their taser gloves and bags of popcorn? I don't buy it. You went through all this trouble for security, but you didn't check people on their way in the door? Are you serious right now? Man, it's lucky that all three of our guys get this horrible shock that knocks them out and they all manage to float face up. That could have been bad. One of them is in the booth with me right now, folks. He is leveling one of those glove devices at me now, and I believe he is about to electrocute me. Something I learned from the comment section of my Jackie Chan video is that the real definition of electrocute is to be killed by electrical shock. If you're not dead afterwards, you weren't electrocuted. You were only shocked. And I think it's like a portmanteau of electricity and execute. What's going on here, ref? I don't know. Actually, according to the rule book you guys keep referencing, everything Amon has done so far is totally legal. Weird, right? I gotta say, I didn't mention it last time, but Amon being able to deal with benders in his weird, slithery, dodging way is really cool. It makes him feel weird and dangerous. What the hell happens to Tano's face during this line? Don't do this, I'll give you the championship pot. What is wrong with your face? Knowing how weak people seem to be after having their bending removed, them throwing them in the water afterwards could be extremely dangerous. Eh, they'll probably land face up. More flashes to Aang in the past, but once again, nothing unique, so we'll get to it when we get to it, and you know how I roll. It seems fitting that you celebrate three bullies who cheated their way to victory. I like how even Ahmad is like, that was some bullshit, I was watching, you see that shit they got away with? <clears throat> anyway, I'm threatening you. The amount of people Amon has on stage with him is very inconsistent. He arrives flanked by six masked equalists, and then in this shot he only has four plus his lieutenant. And then in this next shot he has five plus his lieutenant. His lieutenant, by the way, warped up here after tying up Korra and pals down below. Tenzin, we've, we've been knocked out for the exact amount of time for things to get out of control and for Amon to make his point, but also have a thrilling action scene as he leaves. In this quick shot, all the earthbending disc slots on the arena are black for some reason. Maybe they're empty. <laughs> Also, why did that explode? You didn't load any explosives and nothing dropped from the sky. Where did this explosion come from? It's massive. Pabu is wearing his uniform here, and then in the next shot of him chewing, he isn't. But then in the very next shot, he is again. Great job, buddy. Blink and you miss it, but Korra freezes the water underneath her in this kind of hexagonal snowflake pattern. Oh, that's kind of nasty. I like that. This is super funny. So like halfway into her Superman water spout moment, she had to be like, oh shit, this is pretty far up actually. It's like the same vibe as when Zuko went for that big dramatic jump and just didn't make it. How the fuck did Lin get up that high? How did you get a tether all the way up there? I guess you could have big earth jumped, but being in the stands, I wouldn't think there would be a lot of earth to work with. So Korra's dangling here, and Lin's tether is attached to roughly the ceiling, considering where it seems to go. But Lin just launches Korra upward with one arm. I want to estimate probably 70 feet. I guess she could be metal bending the wire, but like that still seems like a lot. She just muscles it out, and Korra continues to go flying even further. So like at least 100 feet. Lin just launched Korra directly upward with one arm, like 100 feet. Okay, so this shot implies... I don't know what this implies. Did this enormous battle take place before the attacks inside happened? How did no one alert Lin if that's the case? If it happened as it was happening, this one airship took out three others without a scratch, as well as many boats that would likely be firing on it from the water, and that quickly too? How the hell did no one hear this enormous battle taking place outside? Was Lin shocked there? It made a weird clink sound against her armor, and she freaked out, but no shock sounds or effects. Now, Tenzin, I don't want to be a dick or anything, but you're an airbender. You can definitely find a way to get up here and help. Where are you? Oh! Weird bad slow-mo again. What is this even supposed to highlight? The lieutenant dodged her kick in real speed, and then they slowed down the moment afterwards. And there's nothing really going on in that moment? I actually might have used some slow-mo to see the dodge because it happened so fast. I think they got it backwards. This is a pretty genius way to get around the physical violence limits. There's nothing technically shown on screen, but you still really, really get the impact. Great idea. I mean, I know this is supposed to be like Lin is choosing to save Korra instead of pursue Amon, but Lin was going into Amon's airship solo against who knows how many chi blockers, taser gloves, etc. Plus Amon, who we've seen clown on each bender he's gone up against easily. Probably better to not go in that blimp alone. You alright? I'm fine. 
Thanks to you. I'm so glad you're okay. Whoa, you guys got up here fast. Tenzin, and I get he can super jump, but we just landed in a random spot of the arena. Republic City is at war. I was gonna say, I don't know how much of a war it would be since we don't have a handle on Oman's resources, but no, he fucked you guys up proper outside as well. So yeah, okay, it's a war. And the winner is back on track, I would say, after last episode was actually like bad. Even the pro bending stuff was better, despite being way more confusing than any other match. But it goes a long way for them to be fighting someone they don't actually like and for them to be cheating instead of just three nameless dudes. It just makes things a little more interesting. Plus, I just like Tano. Tano might be my favorite character. Anyway, back on track with the Oman story too. Finally, let's get this shit moving. Amon seems powerful, influential, and weirdly creepy. Like when he spits his rhetoric, he sounds sure and calm, and that's a really effective way to make a villain seem scary, especially when they're committing acts of great violence and terror. More Amon, less whinging about the other character doesn't like me as much as I like them, and I think we'll be good. Patreon shoutouts if you want to see the next two episodes of Overanalyzing Korra ahead of the YouTube releases. You can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons, Kristen, who found a pen that can only write truths about the person that's holding it. And some of them are stuff that she doesn't even know. There are 50 Kobold who couldn't quite figure out cold fusion, but he did figure out lukewarm fusion. And then he pawned off the equation for like 40 bucks. That's profit, baby. Kenzie Hagen, who wrote, directed, and starred in her own documentary about tying herself to 50 bald eagles and being able to fly. Kyrie Walsh, who for Halloween this year carved a Medusa pumpkin, and it was so good it could actually turn people to stone. Lafurg13, who actually found a large number of the world's most famous hidden treasures, and just hasn't mentioned it because he thinks it's really funny that people are still looking. Omega Fighter, who returned a 300 pound turtle back to the sea after it got stuck in a tree. Sean Martin, who can hit a power cord on his guitar so hard it can kill a housefly at 20 paces. Stephanie Riches, who achieved perfect feng shui in her living room, and now anyone who walks in, their cholesterol drops by like 10%. Tater of Tots, who was voted most likely to be able to scream a lightning bolt at some point in their life, and they were right. The 1am party, who after unlocking the secret to opening and closing the rabbit realm, can now actually make a rabbit disappear from a hat. The pacifist warrior, who shot a harpoon gun at the Christian devil, just missed. Thomas Lautenbach, who's the only person to be inducted into both the surfing and hot dog eating halls of fame. Tiago Nascimento is the reason cow tipping isn't real. If anyone tries, he's there to push the cow back and keep them standing. Whitrow, who outran a cheetah while using Heelys. Yeah, that's right, that gazelle kill is all his. William Fisher, who was the first person to hit a 360 Vario McTwist with a tech deck, and yeah, he had to break his wrist to do it, but he tells me it was worth it. Zadok, who accidentally carved some runes into his project in Woodshop, so now he has a birdhouse that can stop time in a 10 foot radius around it. And John Wei Fu, who after after surviving Boomy's retaking of Omashu and serving a short time as a guard in Yu Dao in the comics, actually moved to Ba Sing Se to become a peace ambassador for the Fire Nation and speaks freely of the horrors of war in the Avatar. And of course my god overanalyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Ethereal Catnip, Alan Garvin, Andrew Watrett, Austin Gallup, Blue Food, Bob Def, Chandler Crump, Kobe Smith, Dead Rat Fiasco, Deathly Healer, Dizzy Payne, Dr. Xerox, Dominic Saint, Donut, Distent, Aaron Grace, JL, Jacob1908, Jackson, John Ajaka, Justin Fletchall, Justin Wells, Kelly, Lord of Mordor, Mac, Medium D Speaks, Misaki Ito, Nick, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Gregorikos, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatz, Sean Flowers, Super Snipper, the long and short of it, Thiefy Mole, Tom Cooper, Turt Bobs, and some sort of bear face. Next up, the aftermath. No, I don't know, that's like the name of the episode.